I actually think it's really good for my brain because it's so different. And a lot of clam stuff is so automatic and muscle memory and supernatural. A lot of this stuff, it's like really hard work for me because basically I wrote, I brought six songs to the table and then the other six songs we collaborated on fully. But even the songs I wrote, which I brought a bass line to the table, got regurgitated by the session players and turned into something way more crazy and amazing and something that I would never come up with on my own. So it's like every time I'm like trying to play this other way, which is good. I mean, it's a good thing. And I I don't even have all the bass lines exactly down like how Dave, the player, did it because he, he's he played with Johnny Cash for like 15 years yeah. or something. That's a, quite a pedigree. Yeah. And oh gosh, all those guys, it's very intimidating. I mean, you have the double duty of just trying to sing over that, which I, I suspect complicates things quite a bit. It does. I think I don't give myself enough credit because I've, I've just always played and sang. Like when I first started playing at all, I just didn't think about it. And I, I'm always surprised when people are like, I can't like really much better bass players than me. I'm like, how do you sing and play? And I think I take that for granted because I'm just like, oh, I don't know. What else do you do? I would never want to just sing without playing also. I think in my mind, they go together. I've watched people on stage who clearly don't know what to do with their hands or their body or their selves while they're singing. That's me. If I don't have a bit like karaoke. Oh God, I'm, I put me behind the curtain and I'd be a lot more comfortable than standing there. Like, you know, some people dance, some people get completely into it. I'm always just, uh, terrified and nervous is the bass like a safety blanket in a sense yeah like maybe if i'd grown up doing theater or dance or something i would feel more like comfortable in my skin and how to act but i don't do that stuff so i don't know <laughs> did you have stage fright early on was it tough for you to actually like get up and perform in front of people oh absolutely yeah i did open mic nights but before I did open mic nights, I did just karaoke and it was really scary and I would like get wasted, but then I would take it really seriously. So it wasn't like, let's get wasted and have a great time and fuck around at karaoke. Yeah. It was like, oh my God, I'm so scared, you know, and then be standing really awkwardly, but really trying to sing. That was like my first attempt at really singing and uh, it went better than I was expecting. And then I started... Um, I like picked up a bass that I had had sitting in my room for 10 years and I'd never played and pulled it out. Just like I had an impulse. You were already 21 at that point? I was 24. 24 at that point? 25 maybe? When you started, when you decided to yes. start playing music 24. in earnest? Yeah. Late bloomer over yeah. here. How seriously did you take it at that point? I really se severely needed an outlet. Yeah. I was like really dark in a dark place and uh, was in art school and... That is a dark place. It's a dark place. Also, I'd, I'd like just moved to Oakland with a boyfriend and it turned out he was like cheating on me with a friend and had like been keeping all the money I'd been giving him toward rent and bills, just like keeping it. Mm. And they went on a huge vacation together. My apartment flooded. My phone got cut off and I had just started college and I'd made no friends. So I was like, also I had no money. Like I don't come from money. So I'm like in this college, I can't afford completely alone, no friends, no electricity. <laughs> that really only lasted a couple of days, but just in a dark place. And I wasn't like, it's like I needed to be occupied at all times. Yeah. So homework would be done. And then it's like the idea of being alone with my thoughts sounded scary and potentially destructive or something. So I was like sitting on my couch, zoned out, depressed out of my mind and just noticed this dusty old base case, pulled it out. I didn't even know how to tune it. That had been given to me when I was 15 by my high school boyfriend. And uh, when he gave it to me, I was That's like... That's such a high school boyfriend gift. <laughs> well, at the time, it was like, how could you ever afford this? Like, you know, Dan Electro in 1999 was like $225. And I remember just being like, I don't deserve this. In my head, I was like very grateful, but in my head, I was like, he's insane. What the fuck am I supposed to do with this thing? I don't know how to play. I'm not, I thought musicians were just these like special breed of other people that I, that I wasn't. And I was just like, I don't know what he expects me to do with this thing. So it just sat in the corner of my room for 10 years. We didn't feel a sense of obligation that he had given you this expensive bass that you should at least like try to figure out what was going on with he it. He taught me how to play part of Reptile by Nine Inch Nails. And then we broke up 
a few months later. So I didn't have to do that. It sounds like you're battling depression or, or something close to it. And you still had that compulsion to make something creative. I mean, it, it often goes in the other direction, right? Oftentimes when you're in a dark place, it's hard for you to enjoy or, or create things. Yeah. I mean, luckily I'm a creative person and that shit is comforting. And it's like, I know that I didn't want to slip too much deeper and go to a place where I like, yeah where you're talking about where I couldn't do something. So I was just feeling like desperate and like kind of panicky for something to do beyond all my school shit. So I picked up the bass and wrote a song like right there. And then later I wrote another song and I became totally obsessed and just started playing constantly and had like four songs. Two of my brothers I'm very close with and they kept encouraging me to like show the songs to people, but I was too scared. Finally, I, I had gone to go see a friend played an open mic and my brother's like, you got to do it. You got to do it. So they encouraged me to play this open mic. And I was so scared. I was crying and my fingers hurt so bad because I'd only been playing bass yeah. for a week or something that I had like a, a glove on one hand that was covered in blisters. So, I mean, it wasn't that long of a ramp up if you would only been playing for a week at that point. I don't actually know how long it was. It was like pretty, I think I've been just playing privately for a little while and then I Play the open mic night and was like, well, you know, it's like I could tell it's cathartic. And have you been open to mic nights? It's been a long time, but yeah, I, I've not performed at them, but I've been to them. What's interesting about them and why I think I felt more comfortable there than like in front of my peers yeah. was because most people who go to an open mic night are going for themselves. They're like, it's cathartic. Yeah, I'm ready to be turned into <laughs> a rock star. I'm going to get discovered by Mr. Big tonight. And it seems like they don't care about the other musicians. So it was like, cool, no one will be paying attention to me. Everyone's waiting for their turn. So it was a way to do something out loud and just like test the waters of being in front of people, even if they're not paying attention. You didn't have any Mr. Big related expectations at that point? No, no, no. Yeah. I didn't think Shannon, Shannon the Clams would go anywhere. I got asked to play a house party. So Shannon and the Clams, you had already come up with the concept and everything else yes, at that point? Just me. Yeah. So that is the name's a joke. How high concept was it at that point? Or was it just a name? Not and at a, all. Four songs. Stupid name. Yeah. Four songs. It was a joke. I thought I'd play like three open mics and lose interest. That's what I thought I would do. But yeah, that's not what happened at all. I got asked to play a house party and I was way scared because it was like all my college peers were going to be there and I like didn't want to play by myself in front of them. So I assembled a band. It wasn't the right fit, but it was cool that I got people together because it was like, oh, playing with people feels good. It's fun. You're sort of accountable and like you become a better, a better musician playing with other people. After that, the lineup changed a bit and the house party we played was actually Cody's house before he was in the band. He was always a big encouraging force. Him and my brothers when the band first started. And then eventually a, a bunch of people suggested I get Cody to join. So I got him in the band and it was the perfect fit, really. That must take some of the pressure off of you when you're actually playing with other people. I mean, you know, talk about having all eyes on you when you're standing up on stage, mm. especially with the bass, right? You were singing over the bass. I mean, all of it felt hard. Yeah. Nothing was easier. No, there wasn't one thing that was easier than, than the other. It's like being in front of people was hard. Playing the bass was hard. Singing was hard. And I'm also like learning before people's eyes it was so new to me did you get that sort of that imposter syndrome when you were starting out when you were surrounding yourself by people who, people who had been doing this for a little while and you had been doing it for you know maybe a few months at that point totally but i've got a serious make, fake it till you make it yeah. attitude in a positive way and luckily i was surrounded by really encouraging people and i feel like the oakland diy punk art scene is like people want you to try you know like if you've never done it before if it's really hard like i was really encouraged to just go for it anyway so if i'd been around people who were like oh she sucks she doesn't know how to play technically i probably wouldn't have kept going but the fact that no one was concerned about my skill level and people were just excited that i was doing something and that they could see value in the songs i luckily got a lot of encouragement and i think that's a big big part of it is the scene it, i came up in there's up and downs to all scenes, and, and I, I get the feeling like a place like New York, in some ways, perhaps like a bigger platform in terms of maybe getting discovered, or at least, you know, it was until, you know, the internet kind of changed everything, but it's got to be incredibly cutthroat here. <laughs> I, in I New York? Yeah, I, I suspect that there's a lot of people who like don't want other people to succeed. I know that there, there's a wide, there's everybody, every kind of person sure. in New York, but I definitely feel like New York and LA have this, there's a big vibe that's hovering around yeah. that's success yeah. 
Yeah. I'm going there to make it and be successful. Of course, everyone wants to be successful, but there's a more dominant vibe of that in New York and LA, I think. But then there's also people that are just like, this feels good. This is cathartic. This is good for me. This is good for people. Well, I think part of it too is, is, you know, this is a place LA is like this. San Francisco is, is definitely like this as well, where there isn't really a safety net. It's really hard to sort of go and pursue something creatively because it's so expensive to live here. Like you have to really put your head down and work as much as possible to pay the rents. And Oakland is probably getting there. If it's not there so at this point, sad. I think it's, as bad. I suspect that that's probably changed quite a bit in the 10 years since you've you've been there. I mean, I grew up around there and Oakland oh, totally. was very different. Very different. Has that had a dramatic effect on the music scene at all? Oh, so many people are gone. Tons of people have been, you know, they can't afford to live there anymore. And, um, you know, when like creative folks don't tend to have money, yeah. you know, they're work, they're like, working hard on honing their skills and they can't commit to some high paying nine to five or maybe don't have that opportunity. It's like somewhere affordable and like Oakland is a really interesting place and I'm contributing to the gentrification of course. And I've, but I have also completely seen it evolve like before my eyes. I don't know. It's set, everything that's happening sad. There's bit, a lot of bittersweet things like, Oh, now I don't feel as scared walking around doing this or that in my neighborhood. But it's also like, that's also just a reminder of all the people who have been pushed away and pushed to the edges and becoming more desperate, you know, and someone like me or you moving there is, is contributing to that. But what do you, what are you supposed to do? I have this conversation a lot about San Francisco specifically, because, you know, again, I'm from the, the area and I go back several times a year for work and it's always going to be a city that's close to my heart that I love. And there's a lot about it that I still love, but it depresses the shit out of me every time I go there. You actually see like culture being yeah. watered down in San Francisco. I mean, it goes beyond that. And, and I suspect this is something you can speak to. I know that you had um, worked in a hospital at some point. So mm -hmm. you've sort of seen some of the horrible mental health issues that are happening in the Ugh. Bay Area firsthand. All of California, they have just keep cutting funding all the time for state hospitals. So these are the place I worked was a mental institution for the criminally insane. So that's basically prison for mentally ill people. And I mean, and of course they cut funding for all kinds of stuff, but mental health is one that I really don't think people should fuck around with. If anything, put way more money into it. It's sad. I mean, when I first started working there, it was definitely scary and, and dangerous. And I grew up in that world. My mom worked there for 35 years. My grandpa was the fire chief or my grandma was in charge of food service. Mm. My mother and siblings, they actually grew up on the grounds. And when I was a little kid, I would go to work with my mom because I didn't like daycare. So I grew up working with people with a variety of mental states. And I think that was good for me. I think it made me definitely open, more open-minded and also, I don't know, responsible and respectful of those kinds of situations and but anyway so when I first started working there yeah it was you had to be careful at all times but also um, didn't realize how bad things were gonna get because as they started cutting staff because of huge budget cuts you're losing lots of people who have been educated for years in mental health and they're being replaced by people with minimal schooling mm. because they don't you know they're cheap they don't cost nearly as much so then the quality of service is being reduced greatly toward clients who need it really, really, really bad. Hospital police are being replaced by security guards. That's a huge difference. Registered nurses are being replaced by LVNs, you know, scary. So then when you call basically 911 when you have an emergency, I worked in a grocery store. So if we had an emergency and you dial 911, the two hospital police might be completely busy tackling a patient somewhere and they send security guards that don't have any experience with these kinds of situations. It was just like putting everyone in danger at all times. <laughs> it's It wasn't good. That's essentially why I quit working. Plus I was commuting from Oakland all the way back to Napa. I mean, that's the kind of job I, you know, I've never had anything, you know, nearly at that level, but I, I've certainly had jobs where it's impossible to sort of go home and shut your brain off. Right. I mean, you, you take that with you, the things you see. Absolutely. I mean, there's a lot of sad you see a lot of sad stuff and i'm someone that legitimately cared and really felt invested even though i worked in a grocery store i felt very invested in seeing people improve and get the help they needed i think what was really hard about it is the staff a lot of the staff are jaded and 
state cuts to all employees. So it's you know, almost impossible to not be after a while course. to at least get burned out. Yeah, you're in you're in danger every day. And oh, they cut your money. You're getting yeah. you. So now you're putting yourself in danger for less money, and you're not being appreciated. There's no way that anyone's showing you any appreciation, and the job can be really depressing. People are gonna stop caring and not work as hard. I get that, but I feel like you. If you're going to work in mental health, you can't fuck around. Like, yeah. You maybe need to find a different job. You know, it's re it's just the whole thing is it's all like a double-edged sword. Was that while you were going to school that you were working there? Yeah. So I started working there as soon as I graduated high school. So I worked there from when I was 18 till I was 24. So I w only worked there an additional six months after I started college. Like I couldn't even afford because I didn't pay that well. And it was, I cut down to weekends, couldn't afford the gas. And, um, you were like losing money to work at that was job. Losing money to yeah. work there. I was like, well, I need a job. And, yeah. And I didn't have any time in school. I was so busy. Did you have any grand plans or at least idea of what you wanted to be when you started going to school? I mean, I really wanted to be an illustrator. Yeah, I want. Well, I wanted to be a painter at first, and then I was like, I was a little dis. I was a little disappointed by the painting and drawing department. I met a lot of amazing teachers, mostly because I really wanted to learn technical skills mm. in order to become like a much better technically skilled painter. Yeah, and the classes I was taking were more like paint this thing in the middle of the room. We're not going to tell you how, just like see what you can do, which I get that way of thinking, but I was felt like in my mind, I was paying for technical skills. And then illustration department is a lot more technical and it's like kind of too much. So like I was too painterly for illustration and I was like too, not too technical for painting, but all my paintings like tell a story, you know, it's not just like up for grabs, whatever you want. They look. The music enters into the picture and that does the, illustration and painting does that just sort of like drift into the background in the process i was doing both heavily for many years and now that i'm touring so much music is absolutely the forefront but i yeah. do still paint and i sell prints and that's been a good thing for me and i'm i'm actually really happy that it's still a part of my life because it's my first love and very important to me when i was a little kid i basically my first way of like finding relief in like sad and stressful situations was very similar to the way i write songs but it was with drawings so like you know it, it's funny to me now but i'd be so enraged or so sad say it was just my brothers picking on me i'd like draw really enraged photos of me in a karate gi, like fighting them, like comics kind of. Yeah. Or this one time when, after my parents got divorced, I was really angry with my mom because she went on a vacation to Hawaii or Mexico. She went on a bunch of vacations after she divorced my dad and she left us kids to just hang out with our dad who was depressed as hell. So it was, it sucked. You know, it was like mom's having a great time with her boyfriend and while we're left behind. So I draw these pictures of my mom with like, she had a pinched nerve or sciatica or something. Yeah. And I drew these like angry looking nerves all over her body and like made her look all fucked up. But it made me feel different. I think like removing whatever toxic stuff is going on and taking it out. Like writing a song is me is like containing something and removing it and having a look at it and deciding how you feel after you've like removed it and you've had a look. You feel like it's the song equivalent to drawing yourself in a cry to keep beating your brothers up? Yeah, absolutely. How direct of a process is that? I mean, obviously when you're a little kid, there's not really, there's no filters or there's nothing removed. You have a feeling or experience and you feel that in a very like real and visceral way. You go into your room and you draw, you know, obviously we process things differently as an adult or will you get into an argument with someone and just sort of go down and start start writing a song yeah like last night i had a i had like a sort of upsetting sad text message with a friend and i was just like process it like after we you know figured it out i was just like laying in my bed like thinking about it and processing and a melody just came into my mind and there was two other people sleeping in the room so i went to the bathroom and shut the door and just like started like humming and singing this melody into my phone so that later i can come back to it i mean it's the same thing as like drawing the gi. Is it always that easy? I'll say that I am lucky that melodies come to me. I don't sit down and I'm like, okay, I'm going to write a song. I need to write a song. If I were to write a song, I would start like this. I can do it like that, but it feels, it doesn't usually feel as genuine in the end when the song's done. It's more like, okay, 
I need to go for a drive. No music. So I'll be driving and melodies kind of float into my head. So you do need to put yourself into a place where you, you're going to write a song. I mean, obviously, like when it gets to a point when and this is like your, your main gig, you need to make sure that you're working to some degree. I mean, your process is going to be different than other people's, but you do need to make sure that over a certain period of time that you are working on things and that you are writing songs. Yeah. Yeah. It sounds like you found, I don't want to say force it, but you found, you know, creative ways to really sort of um, jumpstart the process. Yeah. It's like I, I have a little, a couple tricks to tap in. How different was the creation of the solo record versus the band stuff? I mean, was, did, did you approach the entire thing differently? I mean, it, it just was so completely different. You know, it took me years to be comfortable showing demos to Cody. And he's my best friend. And that, you know, really, and even now sometimes I'll feel shy. So to go bring my demos to someone who's basically a stranger who I'd only met once, who's, you know, perfectly nice. Not that that has anything to do with it, but. Also a famous rock star. Yeah. I was also like, yeah, exactly. To be so vulnerable, but also knowing this is an amazing opportunity. Don't blow it. Don't waste your time being shy and nervous. Like I had to tap into fake it till you make it the entire time I was there, which I would be so mentally exhausted. And we would play from, we'd usually start at eight in the morning and then not end till like 11 PM. Yeah. We'd just be in Dan's a workaholic. Yeah. He's like a really hardworking guy. Like he is stoked in the, he like doesn't want to leave. I mean, the two things I know that Dan loves are working in the studio as hard as possible and his family, his like two little kids and his wife. Those are the only things he wants to do. He doesn't want to go get a piece of pizza. Doesn't want to go to the movies. Definitely doesn't want to go to a show. He wants to be in the studio or playing with his kids. I don't know. It's like I definitely had felt so much pressure to work as hard as him, do the best I could to represent myself, but like a better version, <laughs> a better version or a more, not more prepared, but more confident more, version. More competent and confident version. Competent and confident. Yeah. When that situation comes along and obviously the dynamics are very different than being in a band with people that you know and are friends with and went to school with. Does the imposter syndrome kind of click back on? Oh yeah. I, the whole time I was telling myself I didn't deserve to be there and that they must have mistaken me for someone else. That was really strange. It felt like I was like starting from scratch with my self-esteem starting at the bottom. I really over and over again was telling myself I didn't deserve the opportunity that they thought they knew me, but they were all wrong. Yeah. And it's sad to beat yourself up like that. But I do think it was a situation where it's like I had to get real low yeah. before I could start climbing back up. Do you feel that those sorts of emotions can be and were a, a motivating factor in that you're feeling kind of shitty about yourself, but you're in the situation and you're like, well, this means I have to push it extra hard in order to yeah i mean i was so anxiety riddled the whole time it made me push some boundaries and you know working with the big dogs it definitely made me reach deeper uh musically like i think that i feel like my singing i really pushed my singing yeah. it also seems like it's more out there in the production too it's a difference between a band dynamic and a solo project but it seems like dan was very cognizant of the fact that it was a solo project and that your vocals were going to be like way the hell out there. Yeah. And I'm glad because the earlier days of Shannon Clams, like I was, af I think afraid of like committing to being really good. What does that mean? Okay. For instance, what I'm wearing, I'm wearing a dress. No one can see me I'm wearing a dress and I'm someone who's too afraid to look all the way nice. So I'm wearing a fucking disgusting pair of flip flops. I could have put on some shoes that matched the dress, could have put a little bow in my hair, and then had like a complete look and would it probably look better. But there's this part of me that's like scared of who that would be. So I think it's kind of the same where in the early days, I didn't want to try getting vocal lessons because I was like, well, what'll happen if I get really good? Is my voice going to be totally different? Oh. Am I going to ruin what I had going for me or become a better bass player? I was like so comfortable being shitty and not working on the tone on the bass amp because I was afraid if I showed that I cared that it would open me up to more... Criticism's not the right word, but do you smell what I'm stepping in? If you were giving it your all, you're opening yourself up to criticism because it's clear that yeah, you're really trying. Yeah, and afraid trying. of failing. Yeah. You know, it's like, what if I put the outfit on, I put on the nice shoes and I put the bow in my hair and I went all the way with the uh -huh. outfit. It's like, what if in the end I put all, I put on like this monkey suit and then it actually looks 
dumb or I feel like it's not me. You know, it's just hard. It's I think it's hard to commit completely sometimes. So I guess the next thing I'm getting at is like I committed fully with my vocals yeah. on the solo. I was like, you know what? I don't normally I wouldn't normally sing like that because I'm afraid that I'll sound it'll sound too beautiful. And this time I was like, fuck it. Be as beautiful as you think you possibly can. Like, push it. Like, fine, sound like a diva. Try. The music that we really love is the stuff that's kind of fucked up and kind of off kilter, too, right? I mean, it's the stuff that's a little weird and, and yeah. out there. I love fucked up stuff, but occasionally something perfect, perfectly balanced and polished is just exactly what you need. Righteous Brothers Unchained Melody. That is perfect. There's nothing fucked up there. Beach but then, Boys. Beach or, Boys, yeah. perfect. But then something like Angel Baby by Rosie and the Originals. Listen to her voice. Yeah. Not that great, but it's amazing. And listen to that sax solo. That is the most fucked up solo I've ever heard in my life, and it's my favorite one. Are you playing a character when you're on stage? I don't think so. I think I'm playing a different version of myself. What's the difference between you now off stage and you on stage? I mean, whoever it is on stage has the confidence to be on stage, which yes, you don't true. necessarily do when you're off stage. That's true. And I think dressing up fully with sparkles and that is me, but it's like my day to day life. I don't want to do that. Today's different. I'm trying to wear colors lately, but I wear black pretty much every single day. It's like giving day to day Shannon a break and then giving other Shannon some a little air. Was the songwriting process that different between the band and the solo project? Yeah, it was really different. I showed Dan some the demos and a lot of them he'd just sit down with me and he'd figure out the chords on guitar as I played through it so that we would just have like a, a structure we could show the session guys. What, what does a demo sound like for you? Um, me singing over a, a really simple bass line. Okay. It's very skeletal. It's skeletal, but I'll usually have lyrics and a bridge i'll have it together but it's just my voice i used to do more in-depth demos with drums and stuff like that where i'd just be like slapping my thighs like on garage band but they updated garage band so many times that i just feel like a lost granny and i have no idea what's going on in there anymore so i gave up and now i just and it's fine because the demos change a lot more than they used to it sounded like in some ways this kind of came together really quickly yeah i mean i met dan and then and we hit it off and he was like, you got to come record. And I was like, you're crazy. You don't want that. He's like, yes, I do. Why would I say that? He's like a very straightforward person. Yeah. And I'm like, a, who me? That's a thing that people say to each other all the time. Like, oh, we should hang out. Oh, we should go like record. They never mean it. And I was just like, logistically, how would I do that? I have no money. It's like, how could I? I, can't, I couldn't even afford a plane ticket to get to Nashville, let alone pay for these sessions. So I was like, okay, yeah, sure. We'll talk about it someday. But he kept being like, no, seriously, when are you coming? Can you come in two weeks? Did you have an album's worth of songs when you were having this conversation? No, I had one song. I had Golden Frames. Yeah. And to me, it was like a joke. It wasn't a joke. The content was real. But in the demo, I'm singing it like Reba McIntyre. I'm sure some of this is a side effect of being a natural, but it's, it is a country record in some ways. Yeah. And that was there from the beginning? I wanted to do a few country songs. So I wanted Golden Frames to be like super 80s country. When I first finally got it together and went to the studio, I wanted a country record. But was like, as I was writing songs, I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know how to write country songs. Like, I had a few demos that didn't make the cut. And some I didn't even show Dan because I was like feeling too embarrassed. But then it's like, as we started doing co-writes or he'd mess around, we'd mess around on a demo I brought. It was like, this doesn't have to be a country record. It just like naturally twists and turns all the time. And I'm grateful for that. Like, this album has so much going on. Like, it's, I feel really happy with all the directions it took. I'm glad I wasn't like, no, you guys, it doesn't sound country enough. I was really glad that I was like, whoa, let's just see what happens with that. And someone's like, what if we try this? And someone was like, what if we try that? Like, it was just so fun to see it unfold. Because everyone's putting their own context, their own history, their own experience on top of the song I wrote. So just seeing that turn into a different beast was cool. Golden Frames is one that turned out basically exactly how I envisioned, but way better because of the strings. And everything, but that one is the closest to the original demo. Everything else is like, holy shit, yeah. how did that become that? It's amazing in a good way, you know. Are you more of a micromanager or do you like to have more control when it comes to doing the songs as a band? As a band, I like to have a lot more control. Yeah. This was 
clearly a situation where it was like, you know, you're working together, you're working together with people that you have no experience with. Who are very good at their jobs. Who are so good at their jobs. Yeah. And, you know, they're they're professionals. Yeah. I am a professional, but it's different. Kind of, <laughs> I'm a DIY professional. Literal studio musicians. Yeah. You got to read the room. And that was hard because I kept being like, I don't know what I'm doing or like they know best, you know, and then I had to be like, no, 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 no. I'm a peer. I'm here for a reason. Like I have, ta I have good taste and I have ideas. So it's like I had to keep telling myself that like, yeah, they want to hear my opinion too. Everyone's working together on ideas. That was a really different part of things. I mean, like Clams, we all worked together. And the last Clams record, after me and Cody wrote all the demos, the boys in the band ended up contributing a lot musically. Where they were like, hey, can I play a harpsichord here? What do you think of this harpsichord line? We we did a lot more ideas together on the last Clams album. So that was a whole new thing. But it was still just different than working with these session guys. Yeah. Do you feel that having been through that process with these you know, very professional people, do you think that's going to impact the way you make records with the band moving forward? Yeah. I mean, I think I learned a lot and I am just a lot more confident and competent, like we mentioned earlier, and much better at like advocating for myself and not just being like, oh God, it seems too intimidating to say something. It's like, no, no, no. People want to hear what you have to say. Something that really makes it hard for me to pitch in ideas is not having as much technical knowledge or hardly any. I don't even know Nort's, Nort's <laughs> notes, chords, scales, key. I don't know what any of that is. It's just pretty stupid. But I know the names of my strings. I know I love minor notes. So it's like being put in a situation where everyone can speak technically to each other and understand what's going on. That is hard. So it's hard to be the person that's like, um, excuse me, I actually have an idea. And then I have to like, but it's your name on the record. It is. I have to describe what I'm talking yeah. about in this way that people are like, what is she talking about? Luckily I choose to surround myself with people that get me. Like Cody is like my translator in so yeah. many ways. And now Nate, our drummer in the clams has become very good at completely understanding Shannon's He's language. fluent in Shannon. Yeah. Luckily. And, and honestly, will too. Everyone's like, tolerant and i am slowly learning more and more stuff it's just it is slow for me luckily in the, with the session guys the bass player dave could totally understand me which was crazy those guys speak another language they play in the nashville number system just like another note musical notation it looks like binary it's just slashes and zeros with like squiggles and it takes up a whole page which is so weird yeah. to me um, it's like speaking klingon or something exactly it was so hard to be like, I really don't like where they're going with this. Like, you know, they're programmed to play kind of like normal progressions. You know, they put their own spice and zest on top of a progression, but it might be the most expected one. Whereas I like to fuck stuff up. And so it was really intimidating and scary to be like, oh, excuse me, guys. Actually, um, you know that part? It's like the fifth time that you do that one thing. I don't know what I'm talking about. And Dave would be like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. This part? And I'd be like, yeah, that part. I'd be like, well, could you like make it go up instead of like downish or over or whatever? And he'd be like, like this? I'd be like, oh my God. You know, it was so invaluable having Dave because everyone else is just staring at me, wishing they understood what I was saying, but I didn't. How long was the process of recording that? A week. Okay. So it's not a ton of time, but do you feel no. like they, they got you better by the end of the week? I don't know that they got me better. Like, I don't, I, Dave, just luckily Dave yeah, was there. Yeah, okay. But they appreciated me. Yeah. And I think that they like the way I write songs. It's like unusual because I'm untrained. So I think that they like really appreciate that about me. But we're just kind of like, everyone was happy Dave was there to help. Is this, this idea of having the band and a solo career something you're going to keep doing moving forward? Yeah, totally. Yeah. That's my plan. What do you get out of the solo career that you don't necessarily out of the band? It's so different. Yeah. It's brand new. I've only played one time. I played one song on German television in May. We did one set at mm. Brooklyn Bowl with a totally different band, two clams, my friend Gary, Brooklyn Bluebird singing backups. Like that was the one time we played. This is a totally different band except two of the Brooklyn Bluebirds. And then I have a show in LA and Pomona in two weeks with a completely different band. So it's like, I have no idea, you know, 
I it's really fun working on it. This band is like more we have a percussionist and someone who's playing horn and like I like seeing how the takes people have on the songs. It sounds like it's both liberating but also could be incredibly frustrating at the same time and that you're going to have to keep teaching a new set of people how to play these songs. Well, what would be ideal is to have like an East Coast band yeah. and a West Coast band. But I have a feeling I'm going to have like six versions of this thing. Which is fine. I'll just become a better musician. Yeah. I'll finally learn Dave and Richard Swift's bass lines that they have on their album and I'll become a better bass player. That's, you know, the positive way to look at it. Do you prefer one of the experiences over the other? Well, Clams, I'm very comfortable. I, like, know those guys inside out. I'm very comfortable. I think this feels so nice to do something new and different. Like I said at the beginning of the interview, it feels good for my brain. You know, it feels like learning a language. You're pushing yourself in ways you might I'm not with the band. I'm pushing myself. I mean, I totally push myself with the clams, but I'm comfortable. This is so scary and different. I'm the boss. I hate being the boss. It sucks. You know, I know Shannon Clams and Sh Shannon the Clams, but everyone has their roles of how to make that machine roll. This thing, I am so lucky to have had some people step in and be like, no, 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 I'm going to help you. We're going to make it work. But I am still having to push myself at being a boss, a band leader, trying to tell people how to play the songs, even though I don't know any scales or chords or notes or anything like that. You know, you feel it, it's better for it, for the fact that you have to operate outside of your comfort zone. Absolutely. I feel like more articulate and like more confident. And I mean, that's only today though. We'll see. There you go, though, Shannon Shaw and me, while I was in the process of losing my voice after a particularly nasty cold, recorded that one in the basement of a Brooklyn bar seated on a giant box of vodka. Thanks so much to her for taking the time to do that. Her latest record is out now, Shannon in Nashville. That's absolutely wonderful. Highly recommend you check that out and check out all of Shannon and the Clans' work. Thanks to Emilio at Q Prime for helping to set up that conversation. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the program. If you do like the show, there are a number of ways to support us. You can rate and review us on iTunes or if you get your podcasts. Like this on Facebook. Follow us on Tumblr. That's rylcast.tumblr.com. That is the first and best place to get all of your RIYL-related information. And I think that's about it for this week, so stick around because we are going to be back just about this time next week with another episode of R.I.Y.L.